Guillermo del Toro once said that the two most important films a director makes are the first film and the last. Within those two works, a viewer may glimpse the shape of an entire life. We can trace the development of a filmmaker's craft, the refinement of their process, and sometimes much more. We may see into the evolution of their thoughts, their dreams, their emotions. If the director is gifted enough, they may succeed in leaving behind a record of the complete contents of their individual minds, perhaps their very souls. As of this video, we have not yet seen Hayao Miyazaki's last film, and a large part of me hopes we never will. Miyazaki is not only a legend and an icon in the world of Japanese animation, he is one of the greatest storytellers to have ever walked the earth. I'd like for him to go on making films indefinitely, but life is finite, and all great artists, like every human being, must strive to express all they have to express within the limited number of works they will be allowed to create, in the limited amount of time they are given on this planet. Nobody can say Miyazaki hasn't used his time as effectively and as meaningfully as he could. His unparalleled body of work has forever altered the world of animation. Throughout an astonishing succession of masterpieces, he has given life to an extremely personal universe of magic and adventure, to unforgettable creatures, both benevolent and fierce, to characters of flawed humanity and gentle compassion, to themes of an extraordinary range, depth, and complexity, in the process influencing generations of storytellers across the globe. What's even more impressive is that this career had a beginning no less auspicious than its later triumphs. With his very first feature film, The Castle of Cagliostro, Miyazaki managed to establish everything for which he would become known and acclaimed. His trademark style and design, his striking control of pacing and tone, even his distinctive personality and worldview. Somehow he achieved this in the midst of budgetary restraints, punishing schedule deadlines, limited industry resources, and while working with a pre-established franchise containing characters that were not his own original creations. Despite this, from the very first scenes, we sense immediately the presence of a genius firmly staking his claim. How did Miyazaki manage this? What about Cagliostro makes it so recognizably a Miyazaki film? How does it inform us of the artistry he would continue developing in subsequent works? Let's explore the history of this project and examine its essential spot in a great director's filmography. The Castle of Cagliostro was the second theatrically released feature film in what is now the internationally beloved franchise Lupin III. Created by manga artist Kazuhiko Kato, better known by his pen name Monkey Punch, Lupin was himself based off of an earlier literary antecedent. French author Maurice Leblanc, in the early 20th century, published a series of short stories, novellas, and novels following the romantic and often fantastic exploits of gentleman thief Arsène Lupin, a master of disguise and a brilliant tactician capable of outwitting any foe, including on several occasions his British rival Sherlock Holmes, much to the ire of Holmes's creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Lupin thrilled European readers of the time with his charm, his wit, and his unpredictable escapes from the hands of the law in stories published from 1905 to around 1939. Kato, an avowed fan of the books, began in 1967 to serialize his own creation Lupin III, a more modern update of Leblanc's character, imagined as a Japanese descendant of the original Arsène Lupin. Kato gave the formula his own unique spin. Alongside Lupin, he placed a number of original characters. There was his trusted partner Daisuke Jigen, an American-style sharpshooter, and his enemy-turned-cohort Goemon Ishikawa XIII an anachronistic samurai warrior. Acting as Lupin's romantic foil was Fujiko Mine, and perpetually on his trail was the bumbling inspector Zenigata. The manga quickly established an entertaining and comic dynamic between these characters. The storylines took their cues not just from the classic Lupin stories, but also the recent and wildly popular James Bond films, as well as Kato's own playful and irreverent sense of humor. 
The manga proved so popular that by 1971, an anime adaptation was put into production. Slightly more serious, but with a light-hearted and energetic tone, it was this first series that would establish much of the now instantly recognizable characterization and style of the franchise, which remains virtually unchanged decades later. Although the series started out under the guidance of director Masaki Osumi, and many of his choices remain a part of the finished episodes, its final form and ultimate success are also due in no small part to the contributions of the two young up-and-coming animators who were assigned by the animation company Tokyo Movie Shincha as Osumi's replacements halfway through, Isao Takahata and Hayao Miyazaki. Miyazaki began his career in 1963, at a time when anime was just beginning to explode as a national art form and popular entertainment. Like a lot of young animators then, he was hardworking, ambitious, and driven. The industry he was entering, however, was still very chaotic and unstructured. Animation was being produced at a breakneck pace, so finding work was relatively easy. Unfortunately, the emphasis was more on quantity than quality. Miyazaki would find it exceedingly difficult to produce his own work in this kind of environment, especially at the scale and of the quality he envisioned. Early on, he met Isao Takahata. Takahata was older, more experienced, already directing his first feature, The Great Adventure of Horus, Prince of the Sun. Miyazaki, who worked as a key animator on this film, discovered a kindred spirit in Takahata, and together they would go on to co-found Studio Ghibli and revolutionize Japanese animation. But that breakthrough was still decades away. At the beginning, they were just two frustrated animators, struggling to overcome the limitations of their form. At that time, Japanese animation had no way of matching the level of polish that had been achieved by Walt Disney in America during his company's golden age. The facilities required for that kind of work were complicated, time-consuming, and expensive. Japan did not yet have that kind of infrastructure in place. In fact, many animators then were paid per drawing, meaning that, to earn a living wage, they had to sacrifice a higher standard of craft in order to deliver as many drawings as possible. This was one of the main motivations for creating Ghibli in the mid-80s. With their own studio, Miyazaki and Takahata could achieve the stability and infrastructure needed for producing a much higher quality of animation, with animators on fixed yearly salaries, so that even if they were producing fewer drawings, they could still earn a living wage. It simply wasn't possible to produce movies like Castle in the Sky or Kiki's Delivery Service with their gorgeous colors, fluid movements, and striking attention to detail without the proper resources. Resources only available under an organized studio like Ghibli. But regardless, in their early years, Miyazaki and Takahata fought to push the limits. They made names for themselves on a number of highly respected features, shorts, and series. Miyazaki even wrote and illustrated some manga on the side. They had to slowly build the experience and clout that would eventually win them the assignment on Lupin. When that series was a success, it was followed by a theatrical film, The Mystery of Mamo, which was produced without Miyazaki or Takahata's involvement. Mamo took a slightly sillier, more slapstick approach to the characters. This emphasis on broad comedy would carry over to the long-running and even more popular second series, which aired from 1977 to 1980. It was in the middle of the second series run, in 1979, that Miyazaki was asked to return. He was hired to write and direct Lupin's second animated theatrical film, The Castle of Cagliostro. It was his first assignment as director on a feature film, and he would not waste the opportunity. Cagliostro would be his showcase for demonstrating what Japanese animation was really capable of. In his later years, Miyazaki would be able to carefully take his time on productions, sculpting each frame with a loving and precise eye. Looking at films such as Princess Mononoke, Spirited Away, and Ponyo, we can see the astounding results of this working method. Animation of this quality, naturally, takes years of effort, 
It is difficult and exacting work. On Cagliostro, Miyazaki was not afforded the luxury of time. The film entered production around May of 1979, and it was playing in theaters by December. The entire film was completed in about seven or eight months. Pulling together a complete film in that brief a time, especially one up to the tremendously high standards Miyazaki envisioned, was not easy. Work had to progress so quickly, there was not even time to complete the screenplay or the storyboards before animation began. Miyazaki finalized the plot as he was making the film, an approach, believe it or not, he would carry over to his future productions. For all his perfectionism, thoughtful storytelling, and seemingly omnipotent attention to detail, Miyazaki actually prefers not to stick rigorously to a preconceived vision. He likes to allow his films to evolve as he is making them, often discovering the final shape they must take in the middle of production. He played freely with the roster of characters, interpreting them in his own way, and placing them in a richly designed gothic environment inspired by his love of fantasy, children's adventure stories, and European literature and architecture. Miyazaki pushed his team extremely hard to get the best work possible, while simultaneously racing against the clock to complete the film in time. He is said to have wanted at least another month to polish the film, but given how many limitations he was working against, the completed movie is nothing short of a wonder. The brisk and constantly surprising story involves Lupin tracing a line of counterfeit bills to the country of Cagliostro, where he discovers an innocent princess about to wed a decadent count against her will. This leads him within the walls of the ancient castle of Cagliostro, home to deadly traps, dark and innumerable secrets, and a legendary buried treasure. In contrast to the more adult-oriented tone of earlier Lupin outings, where the character tends to alternate between being a tough criminal and a horny buffoon, Miyazaki's film, like the majority of his work, is geared noticeably toward younger viewers. He constructs an old-fashioned romance, full of chivalry, peril, and joyous high spirits. His heroes are honorable and chaste, his villains greedy and despicable. Miyazaki presents the material, simple as it is, with the same sophistication and inventiveness that have made every one of his films beloved and easily accessible to audiences of all ages. Some of Miyazaki's choices have proved polarizing over the years to some Lupin fans. For instance, the choice to present Lupin as a pure and virtuous hero, without the rougher edges that define many of his other portrayals. Miyazaki's Lupin is gentle, generous and sentimental, a fun-loving adventurer who never loses his humor and does not hesitate to throw himself into the gravest of danger simply for the sake of helping a beautiful stranger in need. These are qualities we come to associate with many of Miyazaki's characters, if not always Lupin himself, and in my mind it's hard not to be won over by their charm. Relegated more to the background are Lupin's supporting players. Jigen and Goyamon show up mostly to deploy their specific skills in the major action scenes, still a welcome way of livening up the proceedings. And Fujiko is a mostly autonomous and peripheral figure, much tougher and far less sexualized than in any of her other appearances. Inspector Zenigata, too, is given a more capable and competent personality, his stern seriousness making for excellent contrast to Lupin's cheerful ease, especially in scenes where they find themselves forced to team up. While most of the focus is on Lupin and Miyazaki's original characters, everyone is still given an important role to play in the plot. There are enough big set pieces packed in to provide everyone with a moment to shine, and the altered personalities Miyazaki has given them reflect exactly the kind of artist he is. Romantic, humorous, sentimental, and completely genuine. Where Miyazaki really shines on a technical level is in the action scenes which he directs with breakneck energy. Cars rocket with impossible speed, and at times seem to defy the laws of physics. Lupin and gang take on imperial guards, indestructible ninjas, and at times even the colossal inner workings of Castle Cagliostro itself, a setting which becomes a character as important as any other. Miyazaki's clever staging and rapid movements make these moments as funny as they are exciting, and he never seems to run out of ideas. The amount of detail and little jokes that fly by in every corner of the frame during these scenes is just incredible, 
and one wonders how many sleepless nights it took to bring those intricate gears and mechanical complexities of the castle's furthest depths to life. Miyazaki may have been working with limited resources, but somehow he still managed to fully demonstrate his exquisite gift for visual spectacle. What's most remarkable is the total confidence of his direction. Miyazaki, even in his debut film, feels as if he has been making movies for a lifetime. No choice feels arbitrary, no idea feels half-formed, not a second goes by that does not feel personally imprinted with his artistry. Look at his masterful control of pacing, something which has been commented upon by many fans of the film, but bears repeating for just how extraordinary it is. The movie opens with almost astonishing brevity, a casino heist, a quick escape, and a sudden twist when it turns out Lupin and Jigen's car full of cash is nothing but forgery. They dump the money and decide to find out where it came from. In less than five minutes, Miyazaki has already delivered his first set piece. We've been given action, jokes, and already, the plot has been set in motion. What follows is a lyrical interlude of Lupin and Jigen traveling to Cagliostro, set to music over the opening credits. The movie slows down to savor the beauty of the landscape. Miyazaki doesn't seem concerned with losing our attention. He shows complete faith in his story, and sets himself to telling it exactly the way it needs to be told. Waiting for Jigen to finish changing a spare tire, Lupin takes in the peace of his surroundings. The moment lingers for quite a while in silence and stillness. That's when, abruptly, a car speeds by, driven by a woman in a wedding dress, pursued by a sedan full of armed men. Without hesitation, Lupin and Jigen take off in a high-speed chase. The way Miyazaki is able to so effortlessly switch gears like that, turning on a dime from stillness to frantic motion, the way he manages to hold our attention even in scenes where nothing is really happening, putting the simple purity of each moment above the usual conventions of movie plotting, is exactly what makes him such a rare talent. In moments like this, Miyazaki proves that in the right hands, animation can be both an entertainment and an art form. Equally impressive is the moment not long after this car chase, when Lupin pauses to wander wordlessly the ruins of Cagliostro. It seems at first like an excessively long digression, Lupin gazing over everything with a strange pensiveness. We won't know until later that he's been in Cagliostro before, and that in this sequence he's quietly reliving some painful memories, reflecting on the folly, the arrogance of his youth. That doesn't become clear until after we've seen the movie for the first time. Coming back to it again, the sequence suddenly becomes one of the most moving in the entire film. Very few filmmakers, not to mention first-time filmmakers, would have had the nerve to attempt something similar, and even fewer would have had the talent to pull it off. That's the kind of director Miyazaki is, never following convention, never playing it safe, and never underestimating the intelligence of his audience. He delivers the fun and spectacle we expect of popular entertainment, while finding within it the emotional complexity and maturity common to great art. It is here that we start to unlock the secret of Miyazaki's genius. His willingness to stop and reflect is not only what sets his films apart, it's what has driven him to take his art into ever higher levels of technical achievement. It's what pushes him to challenge himself by reaching ever deeper into his themes and his characters. He is himself a profoundly reflective person, as can be seen in autobiographical books like Starting Point. He spends a lot of time thinking about his work, why he makes it, what it means. That search for meaning makes up an integral part of who he is as a person and it has found its way over and over again into his work, sometimes in entire stories, sometimes in passing moments, like Lupin's Reverie. Across each successive story, we can see Miyazaki taking this search deeper and deeper. As his conflicts became more challenging, his heroes became more questioning, his villains more layered and nuanced. More and more, Miyazaki would find himself doing away with villains altogether, in order to examine with greater truthfulness how people grow up, how they discover themselves, 
how they face the everyday and sometimes overwhelming difficulties of life. And as his reflections grew, so did his skills. His work achieved a level of visual grandeur that has come to be regarded as something of a pinnacle in hand-drawn animation, continuing to rival even the latest in digital technologies. That work has inspired almost everyone who has seen it. Its overall contribution to the landscape of art and entertainment is incalculable. The groundwork for all of it was laid right here, in nascent form, with this first movie.